All right. Looks like most everybody's here. It's uh, just about time to start. I think the clock back here is like two minutes fast. This one's like right on time. And we will get going. My name's Chris Gregg. Uh, this is Data Structures, Comp 15. If you happen to be in, uh, in here and thinking this is some other class, you're welcome to stay. But we're going to talk about data structures today. So um, uh, feel free to uh, stick around. But that's, uh, that's what we're going on here. I promise you I will not kill you with PowerPoint slides this term. Uh, there's some things I wanted to put up here the first day uh, that you can uh, that you can uh, that you can take and it'll be online and it will uh, will do that. If you also notice, uh, I was setting up and I'm wearing this crazy microphone over here. We're actually taping all the classes uh, as well. That'll all the videos will be online. So we'll talk about how that affects uh, coming to class and so forth. But if you have any, uh, if you do get to a point where you want uh, want to watch the video or you miss class or you want to get a refresher or whatever, they will all be online. Okay. So I, I assume everybody's here. And you'll notice, by the way, we're uh, we're a little bit jammed in here. You guys, I think, are actually the smaller section of the two sections. So I'm kind of I'm, I'm wondering what it'll be like a little later in the day. But we will uh, we will get to that. So let's see my little iPhone thing. There we go. Here's what we're going to talk about today. Um, we're going to talk about obviously some of the kind of class uh, intro stuff you always talk about on the first day. I'll try not to bore you too much with that stuff. I'll introduce some of the other uh, instructional staff. And then we'll talk about the actual assignments. There is a lab component to the class. For those of you who took Comp 11 last semester, uh, I think you'll find that this class is actually fairly uh, similar in uh, the structure of the labs and, and so forth. OK, we'll also talk about some of the course goals. I'll give you a little bit of introduction into why we actually care about data structures, maybe a little bit about what data structures are. And then we will uh, go from there. OK? All right, well, let's see. First things first. Who's the new guy? That's me, right? Um, so I thought, let me see if I can do this. Whoops. I thought what I would do is show you. I'll give you the full screen effect for this. Show you who I am. We'll go through a little bit of that. Uh, this is my first year at Tufts. Um, and I uh, am very much looking forward to, uh, to teaching here. Let me see if this works. Uh, doesn't look good. It's supposed to be Google Earth. There, oh, there we go. All right. Chris Gregg. This is, wait a minute. You know what? Hang on. First, see if I can make this a little bit bigger. Display, displays. There we go. Oh, now that already did it. All right, well, maybe we'll make Google Earth a little bit bigger. Close enough. Chris Gregg started. Little town called Skinny Atlas, New York. Anybody from upstate New York in here? Yeah, where are you from? Rochester. Rochester there you go, somewhat nearby. Um, this is uh, the. It's a little tiny town. It's one of the Finger Lakes, and if I can zoom out here, there we go. You'll kind of, kind of see. That's that's where I'm from. Grew up there. Went to public high school, uh, and uh, spent the formative years there, and then. I went off to college. Now, I actually, I actually have a little bit in my, uh, uh, somewhere in my heart, there's a, a, a piece of Tufts from way back when. I actually looked at Tufts University uh, as a high school sophomore, junior, fell in love with the place, thought this was a great school, ended up, sadly, choosing Johns Hopkins University, sadly, in, that, in the sense that um, I was there instead of here. But uh, I have somewhere, my mom has a picture of me in high school wearing a Tufts sweatshirt. So it's, uh, hopefully she'll be able to find it. I was going to put it up here, but she's like, I can't find that. So, I don't know she's got it somewhere and whatever. Um, the uh, a little side story. I when when I was in high school, my we got a we got a puppy, and my uh, my my dad said, let's name the puppy some school you're applying to. A little crazy, and he says, uh, so we we were going to name the name it either Tufts or uh, as it turns out we named it Hopkins, and I ended up at Hopkins. So you know there you go. But it's a great great dog nonetheless. So I spent four years at uh, Johns Hopkins in Baltimore. I uh, got my undergraduate degree in computer engineering. Well, actually, back then, I guess it was electrical engineering, uh, not computer engineering. Um, but uh, it, was, uh, it was, I had a good time. I uh, took a lot of computer science classes. I actually took data structures. I don't have my notes from data structures from back then, which is probably good because uh, we took the class in Pascal. Raise your hand if you've ever heard of the language Pascal. Yeah, about half of you, right? It was uh, 
actually not a bad language, much like C in some sense, but, um, but I did take a data structures class, so I remember that somewhat fondly. I spent uh, four years at Hopkins and then uh, decided, well, I got a letter in the mail. It was from the Navy. And they said, hey, do you want to join the Navy? And I said, sure, I'll join the Navy, <laughs> as you do, I guess. <laughs> and um, so, so the Navy decided to make me a cryptologist, which is, uh, which is a uh, kind of, uh, now we call, we call our, I'm still in the reserves, and we call ourselves information warfare officers instead of crypto, I think cryptology is a much cooler term um, than information warfare officers. But anyway, they made one of those. They sent me off to San Diego. Any Californians in here? I love you. Yeah, California. I love California. If you haven't been there before, go. So let's see. So I went to uh, San Diego. And while in San Diego, the Navy set, put me on a couple ships. And I'm going to zoom out here because ships go all the way around the world. And we started off on our little trips uh, called West Packs. And we went past Hawaii. Didn't get to stop there. Got to go to Singapore, which is phenomenal. If you've ever been to Singapore, it's a great little place. Uh, and then Malaysia, and then over uh, underneath India here, and over to the Persian Gulf. Spent some time there, sailing around, and then we came back after about six months uh, via Australia. We actually stopped in a little place called Bunbury. I met a nice Australian woman there in Bunbury. Um, and then we, uh, with the things you remember, right? And then, and then I, uh, and then we sailed around, ended up in Sydney. I. Uh, I met a nice woman in Sydney, a nice Australian woman in Sydney. Um, and then back to San Diego. And then, of course, we did it all over again. Uh, the next, about a few months later, did it all over again. Back to Hawaii, and then to Singapore, and then Thailand this time, which was phenomenal. And then the Persian Gulf got to go to cool places like Muscat Oman, and Kuwait, and Bahrain, and all that. And then back via Darwin, Australia where I met a nice Australian woman there. Um, maybe there's a pattern here. I, I promise you I'm not a slut. Um, but anyway, as I said, the things you remember, right? OK, so I ended up back in, back in San Diego. And then uh, it was time for me to change jobs in the Navy. And I said, I would love to go to Australia, right? So, <laughs> so, so I actually applied for a, a, an exchange position. And the Navy, amazingly, and I'd never met anybody else in the Navy who, who had, the, the, uh, had, had this kind of cool opportunity. They sent me to Australia, to this little place called Jeringong, Australia. It's about two hours south of Sydney. And this is the beach that I lived on. And this is the little corner where I surfed every day after work. I uh, almost got killed a number of times. Um, but uh, I'm not a very good surfer. When the, when the surfing really got, uh, when, I was, when I almost got killed too many times, I'd go down to Seven Mile Beach, which was this nice, nice easy to surf beach. But anyway, I thought I'd give it a shot over here. So I spent two years in Australia doing kind of the working for the Australians, and that was fantastic. And then I decided, well, I'm never going to find another job in the Navy that's as good as the one I just got. So I'm getting out. I'm out. I'm done. And I said, what do I want to do next? And so I decided I wanted to be a high school teacher. So the next stop on that journey was, oops, actually, here we go, Harvard University, right down the street. Ended up uh, at Harvard. I got a master's degree in education uh, in order to teach high school physics. And that was, uh, uh, that was a lot of fun. Spent a year there. And then when that year was over, instead of going straight into teaching, I actually spent a nice summer, a very cool summer, in Ireland. Uh, writing for the travel guide Let's Go. I don't know if you guys have used the Let's Go travel guides, but it's actually run out of Harvard. Um, but I um, uh, spent a good time there. Uh, met a nice Irish girl there in Ireland. Um, and then decided to uh, start my teaching career uh, back at Brookline High. Anybody from BHS here? Don't imagine there. There might be a few here. We, we send a few people to Tufts every year from Brookline. Uh, right down the street. and. We were, uh, and so I taught there for a few years, t decided I loved California too much, and headed back to Santa Cruz for a year, and uh, taught at a little school out there. Anybody from Santa Cruz, in particular, Californians? No? Great place. Surfed right here, got killed, almost got killed a number of times. All right about here. And then back to Brookline, actually, back to Brookline for a few more years of teaching there. 
And then finally I decided, you know, I guess I, I think I really want to go back and get a PhD. And my, I was kind of back to my roots, decided I wanted to go back and get a degree in uh, computer engineering. So I applied to a number of schools, ended up, uh, ended up, here we go, at the University of Virginia. Virginians? Where are you from? Uh, Alexander. Oh, Alexander, okay, yeah. Um, UVA, but I bet you've got half your friends went to UVA though. Yeah, there you go. Um, great place. This is actually the computer science building right here. It's brand new. It's very nice. Uh, this obviously is the stadium. I spent a number of afternoons listening to football games while I was furiously typing my dissertation, but uh, didn't actually get to too many football games while I was there. But I spent about four years in PhD school, ended up with a PhD in computer engineering, uh, focusing mainly on uh, computer architecture, so designing kind of the, the low level uh, uh, you know, how to design a computer, that sort of thing. And hopefully here I'll actually get to teach a computer architecture class at some point. Maybe some of you guys will take it. And um, that was great. And then uh, at the end of that I decided, hey, I want to be a teacher in, at the college level. I applied to lots of jobs. Tufts gave me this great interview. I, uh, a couple weeks later they called me up and said, hey, you've got the job. And I said, fantastic. I can't wait to start. And this was actually a year and a half ago when that happened. And it turns out that when you're in the Navy Reserves, the Navy wants their pound of flesh every few years. And the Navy, in the meantime, had called me up and said, we're going to send you to Africa for, another, for a year. Um, as they say in the Navy, that it was, I, I, I was voluntold I was going to do that. I, I did not volunteer for this job, but um, they said, great, Africa. And I'm thinking giraffes and, and elephants and uh, lions and all that, right? And then they said, well, it's actually this little tiny country called Djibouti. Anybody heard of Djibouti before? <laughs> yeah. Um, it's this tiny little country that's uh, uh, about a billion degrees and uh, dusty and hot. I would go running at 5 in the morning and it was, it was uh, uh, 110 degrees out or something like that, and 80% humidity. I mean, it was ridiculous. Uh, and I lived right on this little part of the... I, I'm surprised Google Maps actually has good maps of these, but. Um, I lived right, this is a, a Delta Echo block right here, um, and it was horrible. It's this little trailer, you can't really see them here, these little tiny trailers that uh, you have to go outside to go to the bathroom, you know, this other trailer, and it's a million degrees and there's nothing in there. They do have good air conditioning, but anyway, so I had to do that. So I did that for the last year and actually ended up back here in Boston in October. And Tufts was nice enough to say, uh, if you want to start in January, you can. So that's what landed me back here. So as you can imagine, I'm um, very excited to be back here instead of being in Djibouti, which is uh, uh, not the nicest. I, I spent a year you know, fighting bad guys. That's what they tell me. So um, mainly doing, well, information warfare, which uh, used to be called the way the Army does it, because I was working for the Army. Uh, it used to be called uh, psychological operations. So that's kind of fun. So feel free to ask me about what that was all about. And then of course, oops, and then of course now we are here, back at wonderful Tufts University. So um, long story about who Chris Gregg is, but that's how I landed here. So it's probably a little different than some of your other professors, um, I imagine. If anybody else was in Djibouti last year, let me know. <laughs> I didn't, uh, didn't meet anybody. Um, and that was that. So any questions about me? No questions about me, okay. Awesome, all right. Let's see if that comes up. Here we go. Move the, move the thing back up. That's me. We also, of course, have a number of other instructional staff. Uh, foremost among them is uh, Mr. Bruce Molay, who is sitting right back here. Raise your hand, Bruce. Um, Bruce, if you took Comp 11, you almost certainly know who Bruce is. Uh, Bruce has been here a while. He is a, uh, an amazing programmer. I've already seen some of the things that he's done, and it's uh, phenomenal. Uh, he is a Unix whiz, so we are uh, very lucky to have him uh, helping out with the class. He'll be doing mostly the, the labs and uh, uh, setting up grading systems and, and helping out uh, with those things. But Bruce is an amazing, ref uh, amazing person to uh, meet and talk to, so uh, you'll see him around a lot. Uh, we also have a few graduate TAs. I see uh, Essan over here. Raise your hand. Essan's TA'd this class before um, and uh, will be helping out mainly in the labs as well. Uh, Ginger, Ginger here? Did not see Ginger show up. How about Sarah? 
There's Sarah in the back there. Sarah is also helping out uh, with the class. And we have um, about a million undergraduate TAs. Um, anybody in here TA in comp, uh, comp 11 right now? A few of you guys? Yeah. The, the, uh, because the, the labs and the assignments in here are fairly robust, we've got a lot of undergraduate TAs helping out in labs and during office hours. So you'll meet the, them as you go along. And so will I. I haven't even met most of them yet. But um, they, uh, they are uh, here as well. Okay, so that's the other people you'll see related to Comp 15. Okay, obviously we have a lot of resources for the class. Hopefully you've been to the class website. Um, I've kind of been tweaking it over the last few days. It uh, should look uh, fairly straightforward. Um, the website's up there. We also have a Piazza page. I signed everybody in class who signed up yesterday. I just like pasted your email addresses. So hopefully you got an email. Uh, from Piazza yesterday saying, hey, you're enrolled in this Comp 15 class. Piazza is going to be used for, uh, for kind of ongoing questions you might have about homework assignments or about, or about labs or whatever you want. It's an it's a for online forum. Most of you probably used it in Comp 11 as well, I imagine. OK. Um, one thing, I, I have turned off the anonymous posting on, on the Piazza website. Um, I, I hear that that can lead to not so great comments and things. I do have, however, an anonymous feedback uh, method for you guys. Now, what that means is you go to this page, say at me. Wait a minute. You know what? This thing. Oh, no, it's not working. I thought it had a little pointer. Uh, nope, not working. Um, the anonymous feedback page uh, it goes straight to me. And it's a, you just type in this little form, and you tell me whatever you want. And if you want to be mean, go right ahead. But I probably will only respond to constructive criticism, obviously. Um, but what that's there so that you can say, uh, hey, Chris, this, uh, this class is, uh, you know, you're going too fast on this. I had no idea what you meant when you said, uh, when you said pointer or whatever in class, right? So um, you can certainly give me constructive feedback, and I will try to do that. And I can also reply to your emails such that you remain anonymous, so we can still have some dialogue. Uh, feel free to email me in, in general without being anonymous. That's fine, too. But if you have some reason you want to be anonymous, please use the feedback mechanism so that uh, I can make the class better. Obviously, that's, that's kind of the, the bottom line here. Let's see. We're going to have office hours. We're still trying to work out the details of when those will be, but we'll, uh, they will be mainly in the lab. And as I said before, classes are going to be videotaped and online. Uh, if for some reason you have some problem with like, being on a videotape, you, uh, the, the camera is pointed up here, not at you guys. Um, and uh, I wouldn't too worry too much, but see me afterwards if you do have some concern with that. And then as far as email itself goes, use it sparingly. I mean, I'll, I'll obviously grab your email, but um, the bottom line is I, I'll probably get a million emails a day. And um, the, the fewer emails that, you know, if it's an important email, obviously email me. Or stop by the office. I'll, uh, what, am I off? what room am I in? I don't even remember. Two something in Halligan? Forget the actual office number. <laughs> Hang on. It, I know it's on my phone. Hold on. Mm, let's see. I am in, here it is. Uh, room 228C, 228C. So um, feel free to stop by if you want to just chat about computer science or data structures or whatever. Uh, you're welcome to do that. Questions about the class resources, course resources? No? OK. All right. Uh, let's see. Nope. We are disconnected. Hold on. Uh, we'll use this. There we go. Maybe not. There we go. All right. The textbook. So I hope some of you guys saw my little comment on the textbook. The textbook is it's this one, data structures and other objects using C++. And it is mainly going to be used for resources, as a resource, as a reference. I am not going to assign topics out of this that you have to read or do problem sets. So uh, you can get away with a different version, probably. A, a, uh, this one's version, uh, this one's edition, fourth edition. So you can get away with a third, possibly a second edition, I suppose. Um, really, it's a reference book. Um, if you did go out and buy this edition because you, uh, because you thought it was required, et cetera, you might be able to get your money back. But don't tell the bookstore I said that. They might not like it too much. Although, does anybody buy books at the bookstore anymore? They actually do. Yeah, a couple people do. I always do Amazon. So bottom line is, you don't have to have the textbook, but it will be a good reference. OK? All right. All right. What are we going to be doing in here? First of all, expect some more expectations. Programming assignments are going to be in C++. Okay? C++ uh, is not 
a particularly fun language, and that may be blasphemy to some people who love C++. I think there are a lot of things that can trip you up using C++, much more so than some other languages that you may have used before, Java or Python, or I'm a Python programmer, and I love it. Um, and, but you have to become pretty you know, competent in C++. So uh, keep that in mind, and, and uh, you know, we'll, we'll have to get those of you who haven't done C++ up to speed in it. Okay, so um, the reason we use it for the class is that it's pretty what we call close to metal. It's, it's well, number one, it is a very popular language. Uh, if you go get a job programming at some, uh, some company, you'll, a lot of times they'll use C++, so you might as well know it. A lot of times they'll also use Java. Um, but, uh, but C++ is, is what we call close to metal, meaning you can really get, you can do, you can use C++ to program kind of the bottom level of the CPU. Okay, so that's one of the reasons we use it. And you also, thought, most of you did it and used it in Comp 11, so you know, now we're not going to change that all of a sudden. So I'm sorry if you hate C++. We do have to get you up to speed on that. I'll talk about how we're going to get you up to speed, some of you, uh, in a few minutes. We will have some fun assignments, though. So I think, um, I think you'll enjoy some of the assignments and actually doing them uh, you know, for the assignment itself. So uh, don't let the language itself hold you, hold you back. Um, while I'm thinking about that, so a couple things about, about you guys. So I know some of you guys are probably like super nerdy like me, and you love computer programming, and you love it, and you really want to be here, and you, you are uh, super excited about this class, and that's great, and that's some of you, and that's awesome. There are also some of you who are here because you are told that you have to be here, right? Like you, you, you signed up for cognitive science or whatever, and you have to come to this class, right? Yeah, so a couple of you are nodding over here. Um, I, I'm going to try to tailor this as much as I can to, to both sides of that spectrum there, OK? If you are here because you love it, you can dig in and do you know, awesome stuff and have the best time of your life. If you're here because you need to get this class out of the way, that is fine, too. I mean, you, you do have to put the time in. But at the same time, you, you know, I, I understand there's different reasons for taking classes. So. Uh, Along those same lines, I also realize you guys are in college, and this is not the only class that you're taking. So I know how busy you guys are. Okay, I, I know that you uh, that you have like you know five other classes, and you've got you've got soccer practice, and you've got you know this and that, and all these other extracurricular things. And so, um, yes, you will have to put the time in for the class, obviously. But at the same time, I am I understand that sometimes you know priorities at B as they may, um, sometimes this isn't the number one priority. So I'm, I'm, I understand that. But uh, that doesn't mean you can hand your assignments in late. We'll get to that later. OK, questions on any of that? All right, more expectations. So look, you do have to put the time in. For those of you who took Comp 11, you'll kind of understand this. Programming, for some people it's, it's, it comes very naturally. Some people it doesn't. Programming. Uh, it can take a long time to get to figure bugs out and to, to get your programs to actually work. But you have to put the time in. And you can't just sit in your little cubicle by yourself and try to figure it out a lot of times. Please come to the office hours. We'll do a lot of work in labs on these things. But please come to the office hours or use Piazza or whatever. Don't get to the night before the assignment's due and start it and all of a sudden realize I'm not going to be able to finish this. That's just that's not a particularly good strategy for we're doing this. Okay? The, we are going to do what's called auto grading for a lot of these assignments, meaning you will submit the assignment using this system called Provide, which most of you used, and then you will uh, get instant feedback about how your program, whether it worked to our expectations or not. Um, and if not right then, at least within you know, a very short amount of time, you'll get that feedback. And we will also have in person grading which means that you'll go to the lab and a TA or two or me or Bruce will sit down with you at the terminal and we'll actually look at your programs. Programming, anybody ever heard of the obfuscated C contest? No? There, a couple people? There's, there's this contest to make the most unreadable programming code uh, imaginable. And, um, it's got all sorts of fun rules, but uh, I tell you, what, next week I'll show you one of the programs. It's like people like format them such you can't, you cannot read them. This is not what we want your code to look like. Okay, we want your code to be readable. We want it to have good commenting. We want the block structure to be correct. You know, in terms of tabs and all that stuff. 
Um, so we want it to look good, and we want it to be presentable as code. Because as it turns out, and Bruce can attest to this, in a professional programming environment, you are never the only one reading your code. Okay? And your code needs to be maintainable, and we kind of want to set those standards now. So we'll have that kind of grading as well. So you will get lots of feedback. And uh, I've been told that, that sometimes students don't understand that feedback is feedback unless you tell them it's feedback. So when you get results from, these, from either the exams or the, or the assignments, that is feedback. Use it and make your programs better the next time around. Okay? I don't think I need to stress that too, too much. But we will make, we will, uh, I will promise you we will grade your assignments efficiently. In other words, we will get them back to you as soon as we can. So we've got a lot, we've got an army of TAs, and we will grade your assignments as soon as we can. Okay? So I promise you'll do that. And you can send me anonymous feedback and say, hey, I haven't seen that, that assignment back yet. And I'll try to do what I can. Okay? Questions on expectations in that sense? All right. Unix accounts, uh, this is all kind of boilerplate stuff. Unix accounts, you're gonna have, we're going to submit all of our assignments uh, using the, the CS department's Unix system. So you need to uh, get, in a, get a sign up or sign up for a login if you don't have one yet. Most of you guys are already covered on that. And to get an account, the class web page has, I think it has details of how to do that. It will by the end of today if it does not. And uh, we're going to have to become familiar with this thing called the Unix shell, this programming window, or this window that you type commands in, and it does provide, and it does, uh, compiles your programs and all that. So you have to be able to use that uh, efficiently as well. And you also need to use a plain text editor. Again, I'm, I'm preaching to the choir for the people who took Comp 11. You guys know all this. Uh, the programs themselves, you need to have some sort of editor that you can't write your program in Microsoft Word. I mean, you can, but that would be painful, right? Especially every time you type a, under, a, a lowercase letter, it like capitalizes it, beginning of a word. It's, amazing, it's a pain. Don't do that. You need to learn some plain text editor like VI or Vim or Emacs, all the old school ones over there. Or you can use this one called Kate, which is on all the systems and it's uh, graphical, and, or Gedit or some other one. You can use your favorite editor. Just make sure that we, you can, whatever the file is, you can get it back to the uh, server. You can also use a program. I use a program called Text Edit, which is free and it's on my Mac. So if you want to use that, you can as well. And it'll open files from your computer directly from the system. It's pretty easy to use. Okay. Uh, quick note on plagiarism, cheating. Don't share your code. Like, don't email your code to people. Okay, that's not allowed. Okay, you can't just say, here, uh, somebody calls you up and says, I don't know how to do this, or text you, I guess. I don't know how to do this. And you email the code. No, don't do that. I do want you to talk about the assignments. If you, if you are getting together some people and trying to work on these assignments, go ahead and talk at them. And you can look at each other's code to the extent that you can, you can look and go, oh, I get what you did there. I see what, I see what that was. But do not, no copy pasting. And if you do get help on an assignment, just cite that person's work, right? I mean, say, hey, so-and-so helped me out on this and gave me some great feedback about you know, how to do this, uh, this linked list or whatever, right? So I want, you to be, uh, I want you to be able to work together, but please don't cheat. And by the way, uh, any code that we submit or you submit, Tough owns it so I can forward it off and put it in a program that checks Google and sees that you didn't copy from Stack Exchange or Stack Overflow. Great resource, by the way. Stack Overflow is a phenomenal resource. It's this online forum that you can, people ask questions about how to do something in a programming language. But they know when you ask a homework question, by the way. They're very good about that. Um, but no copying and pasting from that sort of thing. And don't go asking your homework questions on Stack Overflow or Stack Exchange. And getting away with cheating is kind of getting harder and harder because there's Google running the world and telling me who's already submitted things. Okay. All right, final notes. The class syllabus is online. The thing I handed out to you is the first assignment. The class syllabus is online. All the details about grading. We will have a midterm and a final uh, on paper in here, I suppose, or, well, the final somewhere else, I guess. But um, that's all in the syllabus. And again, if you think you're going to struggle with some of the assignments, because this is, this is a class where we start to build bigger programming assignments. If you do think you're going to struggle with that, put the work in at the beginning of the semester, and I think you'll find that by the end of the semester you'll, you'll pick up enough to, to, to be OK. Um, but don't get afraid and, and stop working at the beginning of the semester, because that's, that's a downhill track on that. Okay. Any questions about the class logistics at this point? I didn't really mention coming to class, because the videotapes are there, 
Uh, I mean, if you come to class, that's awesome. You'll notice we're kind of jammed in here. That I, I want you to come to class because that's, that's great, and you can ask questions and interact. If you don't come to class, please watch the video, especially before you go to office hours and say, I don't know what we do in class. I mean, if, the, if your question is, what do we do in class, the first, the TAs or me or Bruce are going to say, go watch the video and come back, and then we'll talk. So um, it's there for you to use as you see fit. Okay. All right. In front of you, you have an assignment. Okay. Most of you guys who took Comp 11, this assignment will take you about 10 minutes, and you'll be done with it, and that's it. What it is is we have given you an interface. It's online. Um, the, the assignment tells you how to get the files for that. We have given you a header file, a C++ header file. And for those of you who have not taken C++ before or know anything about C++, you will quickly learn what that means. Um, we have given you a .h file that describes a rectangle class. I mean, this is like, talk about toy programs. This is like the, the tiniest little program you'll ever write, um, outside of a hello world or whatever. Uh, it describes a rectangle class. Okay, and the rectangle class holds the length and the width, because that's all you need to make a rectangle. And it enables you to, or it, it, has, uh, it has methods that, or definitions of methods, that uh, will allow you to calculate the area and the perimeter and whether or not you have a square. Okay, if the, obviously if the length and the width are equal. So your job is to write the class, C++ class, and another little tester function, well, class, uh, I guess, tester file that has a main in it, and it tests out these rectangles. Okay? And it, it allows you to create a default rectangle of a one by one, or enables you to give one side, which will do a, rect a square, or enables you to give two sides, and then it uh, spits out whether or not it's a uh, rectangle, or whether or not it's a square, and the perimeter and the area. So, pretty standard stuff. The reason we're doing this this week is twofold. First of all, some of you guys who haven't done C++ need to get up to speed. And this is like, this is like one next step from the absolute bottom line program you're going to be doing. Uh, it also gives those of you in Comp 11 the satisfaction of knowing you just spent a semester learning how to do this stuff really fast. <laughs> so you can knock it out really quickly. And um, the other reason is, next, by the way, next Monday there is no class, Martin Luther King Jr. Day. So the next class we have is next Wednesday. By then, hopefully all of you will have been able to do this assignment and get enough up to speed on C++ that, you won't be able, that you'll be able to go to the next assignment, which will be much more robust. But if you do struggle with this assignment, that's fine. The labs this week and next week and the office hours are going to be focused directly on getting you to submit this assignment and getting you up to speed on this assignment. If you haven't taken Comp 11, please go to one of those sessions. We're going to have the, the I'll, I'll, put an, I'll put something either on Piazza or email today um, saying with, with, the, uh, with the times that we've set up for those. Okay, and there's going to be lots of times over the next week where you can go in and do that. Again, those of you who did Comp 11, you probably will have no problem with this. You'll be able to knock it right out. And uh, with the others, please show up to those help sessions. Okay, I won't talk too much more about that. Uh, let's see. Oh, this is more about the assignment itself. Read in two integers and create a rectangle. Actually, we do have integers. I think they could be floats as well, but it doesn't really matter. Creates a rectangle, uses the object, and reports the rectangle as area, blah, and perimeter, blah, and is or is not a square. Pretty simple stuff. The other requirement here, uh, we are going to have you do what's called a make file. Now, a make file is, uh, I don't think you did make files in comp 11 which is fine. Uh, a makefile is a little C++ or a little Unix program that, that uh, compiles your programs based on a set of rules and based on a set of dependencies. And what that means is that if you have a set of, uh, if, you, if you have a number of files that you need compiled into your program, you will, the makefile will do it all for you. And if you change one of those files, it will recompile it as necessary. Okay, I understand that in Comp 11 you did, you link, you you made the .o files first, and then the the actual programs. We're going to skip that step. We're going to do it all at once. Don't tell your professor from last. Don't tell Mark from last time. By the way, that, that reminds me. Um, you can call me Chris. That's uh, I. You can call me Professor Greg or Dr. Greg or whatever you want. But first name basis is fine with me. Um, so go ahead and uh, and do that. All right, make files. So. What actually is a makefile? I, I just went over the makefile a little bit. Make, make 
is a very robust program. Okay? You do not need to learn everything about make. The biggest programs that you'll ever use have been compiled using some form of make or not. And the make files are like pages and pages and pages long. Our make files are going to be like 10 lines long, and I'm going to basically give it to you. And so you will not have to worry too much about it. But let me show you how it makes your life a little bit easier. Here is your make file. I hope you guys in the back can read that. Can you in the back read that at all? OK. All right. This is all, that's the 10 line make file. OK, and let me go through what it actually means. OK? Comments. You can put comments in there. You just put a little hash at the beginning. OK? You don't have to, it doesn't really matter. The C compiler there, that is not G, which is what most of you guys are used to using, I'm guessing. We're going to use a compiler called Clang, which I think is a better compiler for the simple reason that it actually gives you readable and understandable error messages. <laughs> the, hey, everybody, everybody claps, right? Um, G++, they're not, they're not always perfect. <laughs> don't, don't get me wrong. But um, G++ gives you these error messages that are just like pages long. And I'm sure you guys have read through these, and, and there it's a pain in the butt. Clang is much more you know, sane about error messages. OK, so we're going to use that, that compiler. Uh, the flags are just the kind of other command line arguments that you use. Dash OS means make it small, make it fast. And, and you kind of wonder, why would you not always do that? Well, debugging reasons you might not do that for, for other testing purposes. And then the dash wall and dash w extra are just other warning flags. So the compiler will spit out all these warnings that don't make your computer, make it stop compiling. And that there. OK, and then you've got a line that says the dependencies. So see these files? You are going to create a rectangle tester file.cpp, rectangle.cpp, and we have given you rectangle.h for this, for this assignment. Those are all on the line. And then those, if one of those changes, make knows, oh, I better recompile. And then the next line just says use, let's see if I can do this with the pointer. There we go. Oh, there we go. Use clang, use the flags. This dash O means create an executable file into this file, rectangle tester, and then it actually does your compiles all for you. Right? And then of course if you also want, if you if you want, you can actually do, and by the way, to make a program, you go into the directory and you type make. That's it, right? And it runs this script and it compiles your program for you. Okay, and gives you the errors or warnings if, if necessary. You can also type make clean. Make space, and then space clean. Oh, no. There we go. Make clean, which will delete that executable file. Or Bruce came up with this, make provide, which is kind of cool, which means it will run this little file. And it will say, provide for our class, our assignment number, and all the files you need. Right? And we're going to have to, and it also does the make file and the readme file. So that's kind of cool, right? Make provide, boom, you're done. Right? No, no, need to, whoops, no need to type in all that you know, provide stuff. So kind of cool. So this is why we're going to get you up to speed on make files, because it's relatively straightforward. And I think you will, uh, you will enjoy you know, the simplicity <laughs> that it makes, your, that, that it makes uh, for you. OK, uh, one quick caveat. That is a tab, not a bunch of spaces. And you think, well, who cares? Well, make cares. <laughs> it needs to be a tab in there. And that has frustrated people for since 1973 or whenever make was created. All right, uh, combined command line, cleaning, and providing. Any questions on that? You will get to test this. Yes? So within the provide line, how do you specify, if you're just doing make provide mm -hmm. often in the Unix shell, how, do you just, how does it know that it's homework one or two? Or Good point. This make file is specific to homework one. So you have a different make file for each homework assignment. So you shouldn't, shouldn't have one giant directory with all your assignments. That would be crazy. No, you want a different, different folder for each assignment. Each folder will have its own make file, and that'll be it. Other questions on it? I think you'll like it. It'll be good. Bruce, Bruce assures me that you guys like it. He's showed people before, and they've said, this is great. I think it's good, too. All right, uh, back on assignment one itself. Some of you, look, I know you haven't programmed in C++ before. Well, you decided to take this class knowing there is a prerequisite of Comp 11. Um, well, more or less. And uh, I do expect you to get up to speed on it. But again, we're going to give you that help this week, and you will uh, you'll be able to uh, get up to speed and be good to go for the next time. And you may have to spend some extra time on it, but there you go. If you didn't take Comp 11, please show up. Um, if you already have mad C++ skills, fine. Do the assignment, submit it, you'll be good. 
I mean, if you if you don't need to go to that session, you know, fine. But I, I I'm guessing that if you've never seen C++ before, you probably will have to. Okay. All right. Whoops. Other questions on assignment one. Okay. All right. So some of the course goals. If you go to the website and you go to the syllabus, it says, quote, students will be able to solve real world problems by making appropriate data structure choices tailored to the problem, dot, 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 right? All kind of boilerplate stuff. And then it says, um, look, we need to analyze the costs associated with programming choices. And then students will learn to debug, to write, debug, and test large programs systematically. The first, the first quote up there, OK? Data structure choices. This class is going to be all about making appropriate choices and describing why we make those choices and, and, and what the actual data structures are. And I know I haven't even uh, explained what a data structure is yet. Um, but we're going to be having to, to think about what these data structures are and make choices based on those. And I'll give you an example about what that means in about two minutes. We also have to analyze the costs associated with programming choices. We are going to do a number of assignments in here, which if you make the wrong choice about how to implement your program, your program will still work correctly and will still pass all of the tests unless one of the tests happens to be, well, it'll still pass all the tests, but it might take until the heat death of the universe for it to finish, right? And that would be a bad thing, right? We have to, one of the points of data structures is to analyze if your program runs efficiently, doesn't use too much memory, and all those things that real programmers actually have to think about. By the way, I think data structures itself is, I like to think of it as how to get hired at Google. Right? That's what this class is all about. If you want a job at Google or Amazon or Microsoft or all those big companies, you need to know data structures because they will ask you questions about, hey, design me a little tiny program. right? And then they'll, they'll, they'll tweak it a little bit. And they'll say, how would you do it to make it faster? And you'll have to know some of those trade-offs about how to make it faster. You'll have to say, oh, um, well, I could use an array, but I'll use a hash table instead. And they'll go, oh, wow, you're hired. Right? So, um, <laughs> right? so, so that's the kind of the thing that, that we're going to hopefully get you to a point at in this class, where you'll be able to make choices that are uh, reasonable that real programmers will actually want to make. And then, of course, we're going to be writing bigger programs than you would have written in, C in Comp 11. OK? All right. Data structures. Oh, I, again, I haven't even defined this yet. That's OK. We'll get there. Why are we even in this class? Like, what is this class besides getting hired at Google? Why do we care about this class, right? Well, we have to make appropriate data structure choices. And why do we care about this? Well, because we don't want our programs to run to the heat death of the universe or take up so much memory that our computer crashes because it's out of memory. right? But let me give you in a little example. The, the, the example I give you, you do not need to understand some of the structures that I'm about to describe. You may have seen them before. You may already know about them. But don't worry about that. Try to keep an, a holistic 50,000 foot view of, of what I'm about to, to show you. Okay? All right, here's the example we're going to use. So we care, we, one of the things that we care about in this class is how fast your program runs. right? And here's what we're going to do. Okay? I've written a C++ program that creates four different types of uh, containers, okay? four data structures. That it's, it's, uh, it's just, you can actually create them very easily in C++ uh, using this thing called the standard library. And they are list-like containers. And what I mean by list-like is that they basically have, they are set up some way that you have numbers in them, in this case numbers, okay, like 1, 3, uh, 7, 2, 14, et cetera, okay? Four different types of structures. Again, you don't need to know exactly what they are, but here's what the structures are going to do, okay? And I'm going to do this for each of the four, all right? I'm going to first, I'm going to create the structures and then I'm going to add 100,000 elements to them. Now you think, well, that's a lot. Well, for a computer, that's not that many, right? But 100,000 elements to these. In fact, we are going to add the even integers from 0 to 20 or 200,000. Well, I guess it would be 0 to 199,998 or something like that. What it means, we're going to take these data structures, we're going to put in these things. We're going to put 0, and then 2, and then 4, and then 6, and then 8, and then 10, all the way up to 200,000. Okay. Then we're going to ask that data structure to search for 50,000 of those items. OK? 
Okay, it's going to search for them, and I'm going to say it's going to be actually the first 50,000 integers. So our program is going to say, okay, does this structure we created have zero in it? Yes, we're done. Does it have one in it? Mm, nope. Does it have two in it? Yep, we're done. Does it have three in it? Mm, nope, right? It's going to do that for all 50,000 of those integers. Then it's going to go and delete the first, well, it's going to try to delete 20,000 elements. It's going to delete the integers from 1 to, or I guess, 0 to 20,000. It's going to say, is 0 in here? Yes, delete it. Is 1 in here? No, delete it. No, I can't delete it because it's not there, right? Is 2 in there? Yes, delete it. Is 3 in there? Mm, nope. Is 4? Yep, delete it, right? So it's going to do that. These four different structures are going to do that. Okay? Everybody get the idea of what we're trying to do here? Four things, four different types of structures. They all do mainly the same thing, but in a different way. OK. Here are the type, four types of structures we're going to create. We're going to create an array, which is really this, by the way. Hopefully you guys have seen arrays before. If you haven't, that's OK. Array is basically uh, the, little, the, the memory set laid out like this, and you've got boxes, and you can, you can say, I want the fifth one. And this is the, which one is this one? Yeah, this is the zero if one, right? Why? Because computer scientists are weird, right? Now it has a lot. There's lots of reasons we call this one the zero if. Um, I've, there's a great website that talks about why it doesn't really matter, but some programming assignments do it, or some programming languages do it differently. Uh, we have the zero here. But if I want the fifth one, zero, one, two, three, four, five, that happens to be this one, and I can grab that directly out of what we call an array. OK, that's one of the structures. Second structure is going to be this thing called a linked list. We will get to that uh, next week. But a linked list says, here's 0. And then it has this thing called a pointer, right? And the pointer goes to 2. And then there's another one. And it points to 4. And it, does, and it sets up all these little things. They don't have to be right next to each other in memory, like an array. Okay, You can have one here and then there. But then these things called pointers actually make, uh, direct you to the next, the next one in line. Okay. We also are going to create this thing called a hash table. Again, you don't need to know about it yet. But a hash table basically uh, takes whatever your input number is, uh, applies some formula to it, and then says, OK, now I know I'm going to put it here because it, that formula came up with this value. Okay? And it's, gonna be, it's a slightly different way of doing it. I'm not going to go into details now. Uh, we will eventually get there. And then we are also going to do a binary tree. We'll talk a number of a number, about a number of tree structures later in the year. A tree structure, basically, kind of an upside down structure. This might be 0, and this might be 2, and this might be 4, and this might be 6, and 8, and I don't know, 7, and 10, or something like that. Right? That, that's not necessarily one of the structures we're going to use. But th this tree uh, is. It looks like a tree if you kind of turn it upside down. Maybe it looks a little bit like it. Well, it kind of looks like a tree. But anyway, this structure basically encodes the, in the number somewhere in this structure such that you can find it by following paths down this structure. If it wants to find 6, it might go this way, and then it'll go this way, and so forth. Okay? So those are the four different types of things we're going to create. Okay? I've, I've Called a, I've created a file called container tests.cpp. If you read that, you'll see stuff in there that we won't actually get to in class with these standard libraries. But if you want, feel free to look at that. Again, don't look at the details. Look at the results. Okay, here's the results of this when I, when I create these things. Okay, I used my Mac, 2.8 gigahertz Mac. I used Clang, uh, some flags. And for the array, to do the inserts, searches, and deletes in the array, took about 1.7 seconds. Okay? For the linked list, oh, it took about 8 seconds, a little over 8 seconds to do that. Okay? For the hash table, it took 1 one-hundredth of a second to do all of those. Okay? For the tree, it took about 2 one-hundredths of a second. And then I also threw in this other thing called a sorted array. The numbers in this array don't have to be in ascending order. They could have been 0, 5, 0 6, 4, 8, 2, you know, whatever, right? But they, they happen to be. But what I did was because I knew that they were in the order, I applied a different type of search function to the array. And if you, use, if you know that they're in sorted order, you can actually uh, make this go from 1.7 seconds to 0.16 seconds. OK, the difference between the linked list and the hash table is about 680 times difference, right? 
And that was for 100,000 inserts. If we doubled it, right, all of a sudden, the linked list would take 16 seconds. If we did 100 times more, right, that would take, let's say we did 1,000. Instead of, say, 100,000, we did 100 million integer inserts, right? There are some other factors that go into this, but for the mo for that would means the, the linked list would have taken 8,000 seconds, which is almost a, which is over two hours to do, right? The binary or the hash table would have taken 10 seconds to do that, right? So there's your difference, right? In the for this for what we're trying to do for th this uh, program, if you pick a linked list, you've chosen poorly. <laughs> Right? If you, ch if you picked a binary tree or a hash table or even a sorted array, you've probably chosen wisely. Okay? But we have to make those kinds of trade-offs. And then you'll say, well, why don't we always use hash tables? Well, some programming language kind of do in the end. <laughs> Python uses hash tables for like everything, right? But you don't, you don't have to. And there are reasons we would choose a linked list over an array. We will get to those. Okay? But those are some of the results. Here are the overall results, by the way. For the array, the inserts. Very fast, right? Arrays can you can insert into array really fast, right? Okay, and by the well, here's here's the real reason. Let me let me just go into the part of the reason you can do this. Here's here's what a computer knows. I guess I don't need it. Here's what a computer knows. Okay, a computer knows that there is this memory system, right? That starts here and has all these little boxes. Right? Has all these little boxes and ends way over there. And that is all the computer knows. Right? The array happens to fit into this model very, very easily because this is really an array model. This is location 0, this is location 1, this is location 2, etc., all the way up to location 8 gigabytes or whatever your computer you know, memory is. Okay? That's all a computer knows. An array happens to fit into that very easily. Inserting into an array, you put the value here, you put the value here, you put the done. Okay? Very quick to do those inserts. Okay? Searches on the array are a little bit trickier though. Okay? If I want to search this array and I don't know that it happens to be sorted, if I want to find 6, what I have to do is I have to look at this one and I have to say, is it 6? No. Then I have to go over here and look at this one. Is it 6? No. Is it 6? No. Is it 6? Yes. For 1, I have to go, is it 1? No. Is it 1? No. Is it 1? No. Is it 1? No. All the way to the end, and I have to look through every one. So for all the integers that don't actually exist in the array, I have to look through all of them to make sure that it's not there. It takes some time. That's why searching here takes some time. Okay? Deleting. Anyone know how we delete? If I want to delete 2 from this array, guess what I have to do? First, I have to do what? Find it. Yeah, first I have to find it. OK, is 2 here? Da -da 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 -da. Yep, there's 2. OK, well, let's get rid of it. Well, as it turns out, unless you're doing something a little fancy, you can't leave that empty space in your array. So what you do is you take all the other ones. Well, if you're doing it smart and it's not a sorted array, you don't take all the other ones. But let's say you're not doing it particularly smart. You move the 4 here, you erase the 4, you move the 6 here, you erase the, and then this is all of a sudden your end. There's a sneakier way to do it if it's not sorted. Anyone know what that is? Yeah. Take the last yeah, grab the last one and move it in here because we don't care if it's sorted. So that's one. That's a, a better way of doing it if you know where the end is. Okay. So that's that. And so deletes though they do take time because you're always shuffling this memory around. Okay. Linked lists. Um, linked lists also very easy to insert. It's very easy to say, here's my box zero. Well, I want to create a two. There's another box two. We're done. Right? And then 4. Well, there's another box. 4. We're done. Okay, it's very easy to do that. Not so easy to search. You have to go through each one again and see if it's the right one. Okay? And deletes, uh, deletes are very slow because, again, you have, to, you have to go find them. And that's really the, the hardest part about uh, a linked list. Okay? Uh, hash tables. Well, as I said, hash tables are very fast for, they're fast for a number of reasons. But um, because you can apply this little formula to them and then you know exactly where it's going to be, searching in a hash table is very, very fast. It's a little bit slower to create because you have to apply this, this formula, but then finding things are very fast. And deleting, same thing. You know where it is, delete, boom, you're done. Binary tree, binary tree and sorted array. Those two are fast in general for a couple of very important reasons. The, 
first reason is that with a binary tree or a sorted array, you have given more information to the program. So the program knows something about a binary tree. It knows the structure of it so that it can utilize that structure efficiently. It's all about information. With a sorted array, we know that anything, if we pick a value here, right? We know that everything that side of the array is going to be bigger. Everything this side is smaller. You guys have all played that game before where, you know, choose a, uh, what is it? Uh, tell me what number I'm thinking of between 1 and 100, right? What's the first one you choose? 50, right? And I say, no, it's lower. And then you choose 25. And then I say it's lower. And then you choose, well, you choose 12 or 13. It depends on, depends on your you know, mentality. But um, anyway, then you can narrow it down, right? Well, that happens to be very fast. And you can do that if. We do these things eventually, next week or so, we'll start talking about what we call an invariant, which means that we are saying that this is in order, and we are going to keep these things in order. Okay? And that tells us so much information about it, we can use that information to do things efficiently, like, like search through a sorted array. Okay? We, it's all about information. Okay. I think we already talked about some of the discrepancies here. Let's see. Yeah, some structures carry, carry much more information because of their design, and manipulating these things takes time. Again, all the computer knows, by the way, is that there's this one long array, and that's all the bottom line the computer knows. For some of your structures, like we said that uh, inserting, let's see, inserting into a hash table is somewhat slow, right? Well, it's because you need to, you need to take this structure and then put your information into it in, the, in a certain way, and it takes a little bit of time to do that. Okay, So the computer knows this. You have to kind of implant that information using, uh, you know, by manipulating it uh, efficiently. OK, so that's the discrepancy there. Yep, bottom line, some structures actually carry more information simply because of their design. And that's really what we're talking about in data structures. We say, hey, design something that has information we can use effectively. Okay, and then it takes time to manipulate these things. Let's see. Ah, we already talked about this a little bit. Searching a sorted array. It's fast because you can do it efficiently. I can say, is your number 50? No, you know, if I'm looking for 50 and I know I've got 0 to 100, right? Well, I know that well, I I I, I have 100 integers and I, let's say I'm searching for for the number uh, you know, 1042. Well, you say, okay, you go halfway down and you say, is that one, is 1042, is that number 1042, is it bigger or smaller? Oh, it's uh, bigger. So you go that side. And then you, you can do it this way very, very efficiently. Okay, and that's kind of the key to these, uh, these ideas. So searching through a sorted array, very efficient. Also, deleting. Deleting is uh, somewhat efficient in a sorted array because finding it's quicker. That's that. Okay, all right. Why is there a discrepancy between? in deletes. Well, I kind of already talked about that too. If you can find the value very quickly, you can delete it very quickly, especially if you don't need to go moving all these things around. Okay? Especially if you don't go moving all these things around. And then finally, this one threw me for a loop. And this is for those of you who love computer science and are super nerdy and want to know these things. As it turns out, and Bruce can correct me if I'm wrong on this, but I think I'm right on this. I act, the program that I wrote, if you want, go look at it, is the exact same code. Because remember I said it was already sorted, but I didn't take that into consideration. The exact same code for an array and a sorted array. I mean literally the exact same code. And that, I think, is the important part. It takes less than half the time to insert into a sorted array than doing the exact same thing into an array. <laughs> and the question is why. And here's what I can come up with, being a computer architecture person. I think that I didn't take into consideration the fact that there's actually this thing called a memory cache. If you guys have ever bought a computer and you're like into like the details, you'll know that, well, first of all, you'll know that I lied to you a little bit. This structure here is not necessarily exactly what the computer knows. The computer knows this is your main memory, main memory, or your DRAM or whatever they call it. Right? This is your main memory. The computer chip designers, Intel, AMD, they actually put other little blocks of memory in here, right? and even smaller ones like that, other blocks called cache. And the cache is actually super fast. 
right? And they put that directly on the chip itself. And some of and the, and then we and then they design programs or they design well yeah low level programs that say if you're using something up here a lot put it into this other piece of very fast memory so if you use it again it'll be fast and if it's we have used it a lot really a lot put it into this one and you can use it again okay and it'll be really really fast big question is why don't we make this kind of memory this kind of memory any ideas it's expensive yeah. It's tough to make this really, really fast memory. In fact, sometimes it's impossible because these are registers, which are very, very low level, into this sort of thing. But anyway, point is, I believe, in fact, I could test this. I, I should just go test it. Um, I think I ran the array thing first, and it took that, that program and put it into one of these caches, right? And then it ran it again, and it went, oh, I've already got that in cache. I'm going to do it even faster. Or it put the array itself, and it reused that memory, and it was already in fast, the fast cache or something. So anyway. Little kind of extra knowledge, extra knowledge there. Okay. Any questions on the? Any questions on the uh, t the the kind of the concepts we just talked about? Why we use data structures and why sometimes they're important that you use them. Yes. Yes, I believe it would be. That's what I have to test. I, 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 you know, I made, made the comment to myself, I got to do this, and then I never did earlier. But yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll do that. I'll tell you, ask me next Wednesday, right? And I'll say, yeah, I tested it, and it's the other way around. So if it's not, then I'm wrong about this, and then something wacky is going on. <laughs> I don't know what's going on in that case. Um, but yeah, good question. Good question. Anything else on uh, why data structures might be important in that sense? Yeah, we'll see a lot of this stuff. The, the big thing that one of the big things that we'll talk about are these things called invariants, which tell, give you the extra information you need to do things fast. Hey, Bruce, did any, in the last semester of 15, did you have assignments that you would push run and they would just never finish because the students didn't do the things efficiently? Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah, all the time. Oh, there you go. So you've got a time limit. Haha. <laughs> Yeah. Right, right. Well, I tell you what, any of you really smart ones, smart kids, write a program that tells whether or not a computer program will actually stop running. <laughs> I, some of you are laughing. Maybe you know what I'm talking about. It's, it's, I'm actually talking about a thing called the halting problem. Anybody heard of that before? Yeah, a couple of people have. Couple, no, don't worry. You don't, don't need to know it. You won't even need to know it for this class. But when you take, uh, when you take comp, what's, what's Ben teaching this term? 170, you'll probably, he'll probably talk about the, the halting problem. Uh, it turns out it's impossible to do, to tell whether a program is going to end or not just by looking at it without running it. So anyway, so if you are that, if you are that good, you can do it. Yes? To answer your question, what the last um, two semesters, I think last summer I taught a class where uh, I had people for the family tree, and the fastest, the slowest program ran took eight hours to do the service, <laughs> and the fastest one took eight seconds. The fastest program took eight seconds. The slowest took eight hours to finish. Yeah. And that was just because you let the students pick their own data structures, correct? And design. Yeah. Yeah. And, uh, and you've probably had programs that have run out of memory. Oh, yeah. Yeah, same thing. Had programs that run out of memory. So bottom line is you, you will have to, during class, you'll have to start thinking about these. Because we're not going to, we're going to, how do they, what do they say? We're going to give you enough rope to hang yourself <laughs> in the sense that, we're going, to, we're, we're, going to, we're going to give you all of these tools that you can use to make these programs. And you're going to go, ooh, I like to use linked lists. And you're going to do it, and then it's going to be really slow. right? Or you're going to use a hash table, and it's going to use too much memory for what you're trying to do, something like that. And it's going to be the wrong choice. And so we'll give you all this, but your job is going to be figuring out the, the, you know, the most efficient way to do it. Yes? Yeah, I, I think to some extent it will be part of their grade. Yeah, and it'll come down to the choices you make. Yeah, I, I, I think we'll, uh, more importantly is whether it runs, but it, running efficiently is a big part of this class. So, so yeah, I'm, I'm not going to, I mean, you're not going to have to, I once took a parallel programming class, which was a lot of fun, where we had to, where you actually, the, the person that got the fastest program got to go to New Orleans on some trip, which was kind of fun. So, and. I actually won that. Now I think about it. Uh, anyway, um, I was going to that conference. It was a conference. It was a, it was a super computing conference. I was going anyway, so it didn't really matter. But, um, but yeah, the, the, I mean, maybe, maybe we'll have maybe we'll have some some little uh, 
actually, that would be kind of fun. Have just contests that don't count for grades or whatever, but some contests about the fastest program. Yeah. Yeah, you run them all on the same program, the same computer. Yeah, so you can see what the, where the performance differences are. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So we'll we'll I mean we'll obviously take a look at that. And your part of your feedback should be, hey, you used the wrong structure for this because your program took you know six minutes to finish when somebody else can do it in two seconds. You know what I mean? So, but you will we'll learn all that. So no stress about it. No stress. Right. All right. Any other questions on that? All right. Let's briefly. Let's briefly talk about a couple of other ideas. I know I've been talking at you for, for an hour and 10 minutes now or whatever. Um, but well, I'll just breeze through this, and then we'll, then we'll be done. Um, we are going to talk about this idea of abstraction in this class, okay? and this, this thing called an abstract data type. Okay? And if you go to Wikipedia, right, you will look at, you'll go to abstraction in, a com in the computer science realm, and it will tell you that this is the process of separating ideas from specific instances of those ideas at work. And that's exactly what we're trying to do here. We are trying to say, here's a big idea. How you actually go about making that idea work is a totally different part of the equation. We're going to be doing both in this class. It's kind of fun. We're going to be looking at the abstract ideas, and then we're going to be programming them in the actual definite sense. And this is where. Uh, Part of, the reason we're, part of the reason we're doing that is to make you better programmers and to actually you know, not just try to learn this theoretically, to actually do it. But we're going to use this abstraction to talk about big ideas, like, for instance, our four different types of lists, right? Well, those four different types of lists all have various functions which are very similar. You can insert into them, you can search through them, and you can uh, find values in them. You have to do it a little differently depending on which, which list you're doing, but from a bigger perspective, Somebody using your program or using your code doesn't need to know the details. They need to know the abstract overview of what it can do for them. They don't need to know the details. They do need to know the details if they're going to, if they're going to uh, make things efficient in the sense of use one or the other. They need to know those. And you need to build that into your documentation or whatever. But as far as uh, the, the big picture, we're going to have to, do, we're going to, have to use uh, these abstract ideas so that we can understand how things work. And then we're going to implement them, which is kind of the next level down. OK? All right, let's see. Oh, that's not what I want to do. There we go. We are also going to talk about these things called abstract data types. Okay? An abstract data type is very similar to kind of what we just talked about. An abstract data type is just a model for a data structure that gives this high level overview. Okay? And it doesn't worry about those details. And this is for the data structure itself, like uh, an array. What do you do? You can insert into it. You can delete from it. You can search through it. Right? Those are the, those are the uh, things. In fact, here we go. An array, two functions. You can either get something from an array or you can Put something into an array. You can set that array, right? And this is kind of all boilerplate stuff where you, you know, just telling you exactly what you do. But we don't care about how that array is actually coded at the bottom level. We don't, if we're using that, like we, we want to know that it will give us the value and it, we can set a value, right? Those who are actually doing the coding need to know those details. But that's what, when you guys go to designing these structures, that's when you, you get to make your decisions. You, you actually won't be able to really make them for arrays because that's kind of the bottom level structure. But, um, that you don't need to know how those things are implemented. OK. Did I really? I think yeah, I had two extra pages here. All right. Why do we care about this in this class? Well, we're foremost concerned about the design, right? That's really the bottom line. Okay? And we hide those details for the people that use our code. And when, one, one of the nice things about C is that you can do a lot of what we call uh, encapsulation or data hiding uh, for. Uh, some of these things, and, and you can hide the details from the people that use your code. Okay? And we need to have, uh, we need to, when we program these structures, we need to have that high level understanding so we can do it. Okay, I think I'm repeating myself at this point. I think that's it for now. Are we, any, other, any questions about the class, the structure, or otherwise? Yes? Um, are there PowerPoints Yes, they are. In fact, I think they already are. The first one is already. Yes? La yes. OK, so again, lab is optional this week in the sense that especially if you can do the pro try the program first. Some of you might have already done it on your laptops, right? If you can do it already and have no problems and, it's, and it submits, fine. 
You know, no worries. Uh, yeah. lab Sorry? Lab is, is the same way as uh, le yeah, lab assignment, Bruce. How are we doing the lab assignment? We're going to the web page? Okay. Um, So yeah, so on the website, and I'm not, I'm not sure it's up yet. Is it up? I don't know if it's on the website yet. Give it till the end of the day. If you don't see it on there today, I'll put it there by the end of the day. The lab, the lab sign up. We'll put it on there. We'll make sure it's on there. And we'll go there. Uh, do you know the link right now? Okay, here we go. That's it. OK. This is the lab sign up if you want to do it today. All right, thank you.